Our Bible study today is on Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount continues to speak into our lives today, we pray for your Holy Spirit to strengthen us in faith that we might truly hear Jesus' words and that we might live them out and that we would uh, follow you and that we would be uh, the disciples of Christ for the world to see. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so last week when I was uh, beginning this section, I, I mentioned how uh, when Jesus uh, preached, he preached you know, for um, many, many times over a three-year period. And so the disciples heard him preach lots of different times. So it's most likely that the, the Sermon on the Mount is a collection of the things that Jesus said. So whether or not Jesus actually s stood up and said everything in this section all in a row is you know probably not how it happened. But in the ancient world, that was okay because the way that you recorded history was based on what you could remember because they didn't have recording devices. They didn't have any video. They didn't have any, any way of accurately going back and saying, oh, this is exactly what Jesus said, right? And because that stuff didn't exist, people wrote down what they remembered and that was um, and that was considered good good history, uh, because it came from a reliable source. So Matthew was an eyewitness to what Jesus said. So he's writing what Jesus actually said, and it's not really any concern whether or not he said this in a row, um, you know, because the whole point was he she's trying to tell us what Jesus was trying to teach, and so these are things that Jesus said more than once. We know that for a fact because when you read the different gospels, you see the same types of stories in different contexts, right? So like Jesus, did he do a miracle of feeding people with bread and fish once? And it says no, because there's a, in Mark's gospel, it mentions the feeding of the 4,000 yeah. on a plane. And then it talks about in Matthew's gospel, the feeding of the 5,000 uh, in, in a hill. And so we know that he did these, those miracles more than once. He probably spoke to the people with the same, you know, he had different audiences, so he wanted to tell the same things to each of these groups. You know, he would have adjusted it based on, you know, input from the crowd, right? I mean, uh, if you've ever heard me preach the same sermon two times in a row at 8 o'clock or 10.30, you'll notice that the sermons are different. Why? Because the audience is different, and the Holy Spirit leads you to speak what's necessary for the people who are there. So, you know, they're 90% the same, but, you know, there's... Well, my sermons, that is, but they are, uh, there's differences. Um, sometimes the differences are more, uh, you know, more or less. But for instance, like last uh, week, I recorded my sermon. My first sermon was 18 minutes. My second sermon was like 25 minutes. So I obviously added more stuff. So Jesus um, uh, could definitely have preached the, the material that's in here, and he could have expanded it and several times. So Mar Matthew is writing this down. And he's putting it in a, in a framework. And the framework is for the benefit of proving something. He, what he wants to show is that Jesus is the Messiah that God predicted in the Old Testament. So what he does is he's bringing in all the Old Testament references because he's this was written for Jewish people. Not just for Jewish people, but specifically for the Jewish Christians. For the people who are on the fence, like if they're Jewish and they're looking for the Messiah, but they're not quite convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. So they read Matthew's Gospel and they said, Oh, look, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy from Isaiah. He put, oh, he put, fulfilled the prophecy from Jeremiah. He fulfilled this prophecy that Moses said. And so over and over again, he specifically uh, chooses what material he's going to use that he wrote down in order to, to show that Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament predicted and that God spoke of. Uh, and part of that is, is in the way that, you know, in Deuteronomy 18, Moses says, After me will come a prophet greater than me, and you, shall, you must listen to him. And so how do we know that Matthew was trying to show that Jesus is the prophet greater than Moses? Well, Moses wrote five, the five books of the Pentateuch, the, or the Torah, that's the first five books of the law, right? And so in Matthew's Gospel, we get five different sermons by Jesus. And so 
uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the beginning of the Ma Gospel of Matthew, wh which is chapters uh, 5 through, let me see here, uh, Matthew um, 5 through 7 is the first section, and then there are uh, four other um, descriptions of Jesus's uh, where he gives like uh, extended like sermons, right? So he, he, he does this in several places. And uh, uh, the other one's chapter 10 is another second great discourse or sermon, chapter 13, chapter 18, and then the last one is chapters 24 and 25. And those are all long speaking sections of Jesus. So if you have a red letter Bible, as you page through, you'll notice there's chunks of red sections. Uh, so again, partly because he's writing this from memory, the, the topics that Matthew remembers Jesus talking about in the Sermon on the Mount are kind of linked together by, um, by using topical words. Okay, and again, that's just a memory device. So for instance, um, you know, he talks about in today's section, starting at verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Okay, and so he, uh, he's, he's talking about one topic, salt of the earth, and the word there for earth, maybe it's similar to the word world. And then in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. So he's using these topics, salt of the earth, light of the world, and he's using a word from one to bring uh, about a, uh, a connection to the next one. But if you think about it, you know, salt and light, what do they have in common, right? I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of connection between these two things, except for the idea that Jesus is talking about that you're gonna be a salt for the whole world and you're gonna be a light for the whole world. And so he's using that idea of, of how Jesus is, calls us as disciples to reach out to the world. That's the topical. Uh, connection between those two that's or that's the connection between those two topics right um, you know there, there's a, a scholarly word called a stitch vort which is what it's called stitch vort is a German word that means stitch word it's a word that stitches together connects the two passages and so you'll see that throughout this like the next section of verse 17 he's talking about the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and then he gets into section verse 21 it talks about um, you know, he, then he gets into details about the law. So he talks about the Ten Commandments, right? And he talks about murder and adultery. And then he gets into divorce, which isn't necessarily about the law, but it is connected in, like in the book of Leviticus. And so he's um, going through these different topics that, again, he, he spoke these th at lots of different times, not just at this one time. And Matthew puts them together as a collection for the benefit of showing that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he's going to be like Moses, but greater than Moses, because he doesn't just show us the law, he shows us the gospel. He doesn't just um, pray for or sacrifice for the people's sins, that he becomes the mediator and the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Right? So Jesus is always going to be greater than Moses. So um, back in verse 13, the idea that Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, or he's talking about you are the followers of Jesus, the people of God. So at this time, this would be Jewish people, right, who are, who are following Jesus. So he's telling them, you know, there's an under, uh, there's an undercurrent of, with an assumption that obviously the people who are listening, you'll, you'll only be the salt of the earth if you put your faith in Jesus. He doesn't say you put, must put your faith in me in order to be the salt of the earth. But he had already talked about in verse 11, blessed are people are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So those are the people, followers of Jesus, who will be the salt of the earth. He's not just tell, telling anybody that they're the salt of the earth. Only people who follow Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who, who are willing to die for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. So, um, so you know, he's connecting these sections, and you got to keep it in context. And uh, the idea of salt, you know, this, that second part of the sentence, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? In modern 
in our modern understanding, that doesn't make sense, right? I mean, first of all, salt for us is sodium chloride. You know, those little tiny cubes of, if you look at uh, salt crystals under the microscope, it's, they're little cubes. They're tiny, tiny cubes. You can feel them between your fingers and they, they kind of feel like little grains of sand, okay? Now, that is pure salt. But in the ancient world, they didn't have pure salt. They did, what they would do is go down to the Dead Sea and they would scrape up the evaporated minerals that, would, that looked like salt, but they weren't 100% salt. They were like 50% salt, 50% magnesium, 50% sodium iodine, sodium this. Or, so it was a collection of salty minerals that tasted good. But the problem is if it's only 50% salt, what would happen is you would have this dust. Like it looks like salt, but it's kind of, it's not as smooth. It'd be kind of crumbly. It, it was white and you would, it was like dust. You just kind of dust it on your food. But the thing is, what happened is if it sat out and it got humidity or water in it, and the water drained through it and leached out the salt, what happened is that the, the sodium chloride, which is what salt gives its taste from, gets its taste from, would leach out of it. And then some of the other minerals would stay behind that don't have as much flavor. So uh, you know, the ancient salt would, uh, it, if it sat around too long, like you have a little bowl, and... Uh, Maybe it was um, the humidity would leach out the salt flavor, and then you'd have this tasteless white dust. It would be kind of, it would just wouldn't be satisfying. And so that's what he's saying that if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You can't get the salt flavor back into that dust because it's magnesium and other chemicals that don't have flavor, but they look like salt because they're white, right? And so what do you do with it? You throw it on the ground because it's as good as dirt now. So that's the kind of thing that you would only understand if you, um, you know, if you, if you uh, look into the, uh, the background of the ancient Near East, right? So, so that's the way that they had salt back then. So for us to say, oh, how could salt lose its saltiness? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's why you need to, uh, to look into the, the background of the culture, right? And not everything in the Bible is like clear cut it, it, I think that on its surface, we know what salt is, and we know that if salt did lose its saltiness, it wouldn't be worth anything, but that how that would happen doesn't make sense because of the way that we process salt is they go to salt mines, they get 100% pure salt blocks, and they just crunch it up into little tiny pieces, and it that doesn't lose its saltiness because it's not made of anything else except for sodium chloride. Um, but in the ancient world, they didn't do things like that. They, I mean, they didn't, there were not salt mines. There was not, there was salt, deposit or there was salt that was made from evaporation of the ocean right and so the salt that's in the sea is not 100 percent salt either it's a mixture of other chemicals so the only way you can get pure salt the way we do is from a salt mine and those kinds of places are not uh, most of those are are found uh, like in northern climates for some reason so like in america there's some salt mines but like in, in siberia like we're talking about way north, right? In Russia, there's some huge salt mines. I've even seen pictures where they carved out a cave and then they carved the salt into like a cathedral. So it's an underground crystal church in a salt mine that like in Russia, I saw one and it was amazing, you know, because the whole cavern is just like one giant chunk of salt and it's, you know, it's hundreds of yards wide and they, they dug into it they took the salt out, and then somebody carved the walls of the salt and the edges and the roof into a cathedral. It looks amazing. So, so you can carve salt if it's pure. If, if it's made of something else, it'll crumble. Okay, so Jesus is talking about how th this is like, uh, like a Christian. Okay, a Christian who loses his saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So if you lose, the saltiness here might be a metaphor for faith, right? Because what what does faith do for people? Well, it preserves them, because salt preserves things like meat. Once you slaughter an animal, if you can't cook it right away, and back then there was no refrigeration did not exist, That's right. right? I mean, refrigeration didn't exist until the 1900s. I mean, it's only been like a hundred years since the refrigerator was invented. It's hard to believe. They used to salt the ice ice, you know? <laughs> yeah. They would uh, they would saw um, 
ice off of lakes and then they would stack it in sawdust and they would put it into barns and keep it cold and then the ice man would come to your house my father remembers back in the 40s the ice man would come and bring a chunk of ice you have your refrigerator was basically a box with a a top part where you put the ice in the top and then you cover it and then they kept everything cold inside and but they last very long they do they do last big, big, yeah big of ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um anyways talking about preservation so salt was a way that preserved things if once you slaughtered an animal you would pack it with salt and salt is an antiseptic that means it kills germs and so it, you if you put it all over the the um the meat and you didn't cook the meat, the meat could actually be preserved with the salt. And then you could cook it later. Or if you packed enough salt on it, what happens is salt is like a sponge. It actually draws the, um, the, the, uh, the water out of the meat. So the meat turn eventually would dry up and the salt would keep it from spoiling. And then you could have like beef jerky and you could reconstitute it by putting it back in water and boiling it. So it's like beef jerky, right? So, so salt made it possible for food to be preserved. It also gave flavor for food, right? And so these are two qualities of salt that we could say are similar to faith. So a person who has faith in Jesus, they are going to be the salt of the earth. They're going to bring about preservation in the lives of other people. You'll save people. They won't be spoiled with sin. They'll be strengthened in their faith because of your faith. They also make things better. See, sin, it maybe has a moment of, you know, excitement or happiness, but it eventually fades. But the saltiness of, of a Christian's faith is going to bring about a tastefulness that will last longer and it'll be more satisfying. So as a metaphor, it, you know, it, you can probably draw out lots of different things. But he, Jesus is just using things that people understood. See, he, he wasn't interested in being like a scholar or a ph philosopher like the Greeks, right? The Greek, and he lived right after the Greek era. I mean, at the time that he lived, the, Greek, the Roman Empire spoke Greek, but they used Latin as for their writing. And so, you know, Greek philosophy was still something that Paul was very familiar with. And so he, he doesn't talk to the people with any of those types of uh, high uh, concepts, right, that are go over your head. He doesn't say, you know, faith is like the ephemeral wisdom of the universe. You know, he doesn't go into that. He, he talks to, about regular things with regular people. Nobody can argue about what salt is. Nobody has any questions about what salt does. And so when he compares faith to salt, then they can say, yes, I get it. I would want to live life without salt. It would be a pretty boring. My food would be boring. I wouldn't enjoy it. How could you live life without faith? It would be boring. You wouldn't enjoy it. Things like that. So these are things that anybody who, who heard Jesus would understand. And then the idea that you would throw this salt that lost its saltiness out onto the ground to, to be trampled is, is a warning. So Jesus is giving us both the the, the gospel and the law section. The gospel is, you know, what a blessing it is to the world when Christians exercise their faith. They are going to be a blessing to lots of people. But if your faith wavers and you lose the thing that God gave you, it's going to make your, your witness bland and it'll be worthless. And so it's a, a warning because this idea of being thrown out and trampled by men is a description that's similar to about how Jesus talks about how people who don't have faith will be thrown out into the outer darkness, right? So he uses the same word here, thrown out, as he uses in the parable of like the of the wedding guest, where the the groom the the groom's father says, "How did you get into the wedding without a without wedding clothes?" And he says, and he says he was thrown out into the outer darkness. So it's a it's a word that's used for. Uh, in the context of judgment, but it's, you know, here it's, t it's talking about how people will trample you. So it's not so much what happens in the afterlife going to hell. It's talking about even in this life, Christians who don't live their faith 
are going to be worthless even to the world. The world doesn't need those people. What good are, you, are they? And so this trampled by men, it has to do with the idea of your, your witness that doesn't have any, it's not, if it's not tasteful, then people won't want it. And so they'll just trample on you, right? So, um, you know, the scorn of even the unbeliever is pretty sad. I mean, well, in, unbelievers are going to scorn Christians no matter what. But if they scorn you because you're not only, they don't believe you, but they also believe you're ineffective or that you don't, you're tasteless or bland, that's, that's a pretty sad situation. So we, as Christians, we definitely don't want to allow that to happen. In verse 14, uh, we have Jesus' second metaphor. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp or put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand and it gives light for everyone in the house. So here he's moving. Uh, well, I actually have two different uh, two different metaphors, but they're all both in the context of light, right? So the light of the world, right? And then he talks about city on a hill. So the light of the world is kind of the general concept. And then the, the city on the hill, you know, obviously, well, this is even before electricity, but even when people were um, back in the ancient world where they lit like lamps in order to see it, w it would be pretty dim but just imagine if there was no electric lights at all how dark it would be at night right so that even the slightest amount of light would be noticeable so a city up on a hill you would see it from the distance and at night you could still see it from the distance because there would be torches and stuff around the gates because they have walls around the cities and then he, so he goes from the idea of light in general then a city on a hill can't be hidden as more specific, and then people who light a lamp put it don't put it under a bowl, but put it on its stand. So then you got a, the idea of a lamp, and the kinds of lamps that they would use looks like this. Okay, so some of those uh, Greek and Roman lamps that I just showed you are examples of how you know you, you could only get light if you uh, showed it out sh if you had it out in the on a table or put it on a stand, you know. Uh, some of the clay ones you couldn't really hang them so th they wouldn't necessarily hang it in the middle of the ceiling but they would put it on a stand so that it would be high enough that it was, the light would shine down onto your table so it would still be a little bit of light but you know when it's super dark and you have a little bit of light that's better than nothing and so they were used to that and s the whole point is that the, if you put it below or you put it under a bushel you're not going to see it and uh, you know common sense tells you that that's not what you do with a lamp. And so common sense would tell a Christian that the light of your faith can't shouldn't be hid or should not be hidden. You by hiding it you would defeat its purpose, right? There's people who could do that, but it would be silly and ridiculous. And so it is, you know, God uh, Jesus is trying to remind us, you know, if you want to follow me, don't don't let your faith be hidden. Let everybody know about it. Show it forth. And that will be good. And so the, using this idea about being the light of the world, you know, without light, we'll be wandering in the darkness and bumping into things. It's, you know, it's unproductive. You know, a, a city is, you can't hide it. And so the idea that a Christian could hide their faith, it doesn't make sense. Uh, in essence, a person who dr does try to hide their faith, if you want to be a secret follower of Jesus, during the time that Jesus was talking, People were get it was getting uh, progressively harder to be a Christian without being persecuted. So maybe there were some Christians who said, "Well, I, I kind of believe in Jesus. I, I well, I want to believe in Jesus, but I sure sure don't want to get arrested by the Romans and executed on a cross. You know, that's that's a horrible death. I don't want that." And so Jesus is saying, "You know, if you love your life more than you love me, then you you will lose your life." He says that later on. So he, here, he's not saying that, but the implication is still there. That you're not going to be a real Christian if you try to hide your faith. You're not going to be a real Christian if you lose your saltiness. Those things are understood to be basic about what it means to be a disciple. And so, just like salt and light um, have basic qualities that, you, uh, that we understand about them, so it is for the true disciple. Uh, a person who is not a true disciple will be seen by the fact that they are tasteless. 
and that they are, you know, like they don't add any flavor to life or that they are uh, hiding their light, right? You know, if you have any light and you hide it, what happens to a, a candle if you put it under a bushel? Event, yeah, it doesn't shine, but eventually goes out. Okay. What happens is the, the fire will use up all the oxygen until it snuffs itself out, right? I mean, that's why when you take one of those snuffers in church and you put it over the candle, the candle doesn't just go out because you touch it. It's not, you're not actually touching anything. You're actually just, what you're doing is you're creating a small cavity for the fire to use up the oxygen until it burns itself out. It suffocates itself. It you know, it snuffs itself out because there's no more oxygen. And so uh, that's what would happen to, to a Christian. If you try to hide your faith, it's eventually going to die. It will, it's not going to keep going. You're, you're not going to be a real Christian any longer. And here he says that the whole point of a candle or a, a lamp is to give light to everyone in the house. Now the word there for house can re, it refers to like the, the, um, you know, you're like your family, right? And so the whole idea is, is that it's giving light to the family of God. It it encourages other Christians. It's not necessarily, you know, the idea of a city on a hill is that your faith will be a light to other people, even unbelievers. But the main purpose for Christians' faith in their in their context of their environments is to give light to all their other family members and encourage them. Verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So by Jesus' explanation, he's actually telling us that the light that shines is the good deeds, right? So when you talk about your faith, I mean, how else do you show your faith? Is your faith like, you know, your attitude, like, oh, you're always happy or something? No, Specifically, faith is seen by good deeds and praise. So he gives us two things. So that they may see your good deeds and praise, or and praise your Father in heaven. So specifically, by doing good deeds, whether or not another person deserves it or earns it or, you know, needs it, or, you know, you, if you're doing good things for people just because of your love for Jesus, then that is the true light. That is the true salt. So... And all this, this, my discussion about how you know you need to shine forth your faith uh, to make it concrete. Jesus, he never, Jesus never uses language that is abstract. He you know, he he avoids that. He's talking to, to real people, and they want to know what does it mean to be a disciple. And he's saying you must, you know, uh, shine forth like a lamp. And if you do good deeds, people will see it, and they will praise your Father in heaven. Uh, it's interesting that here in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he doesn't say anything about, you know, that people will see your faith in me, and then they'll pu put their faith in me as well and go to heaven. He, he doesn't get into a doctrinal discussion. He's talking about, you know, something that these early Jewish followers of Jesus can agree upon. Shouldn't we show our worship and our love for God? But what does that worship look like? Does it mean going to the temple? Does it mean... Uh, that we are wearing robes or praying out loud on the street corner like the Pharisees. And he's saying, no, that's not worship. The true worship of God is when you love other people. You, and, and your love for God is seen in the way that you love other people. So it's your good deeds. And, uh, and so even though he's not really talking about evangelism here, he's not talking about discipleship like following Jesus, but he's talking about faith is seen by your actions. That was something that, you know, you could definitely get on board with. And because Jesus is being pictured by Matthew as like the new, greater Moses, then, you know, he, 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 Jesus is saying a lot of things that Moses would have talked about, you know, about your conduct, about your life. How do you live? And so these things are, um, are seen in the way that Jesus is drawing people to... Uh, to God's covenant with the people of Israel and saying, you know, this is what it means to be a, a true uh, follower of God. Because the Pharisees were doing their own thing. They thought, oh, we're better than everybody else. And Jesus is saying, well, acting like a Pharisee is not going to get you into heaven, but showing your good deeds so that others may praise your Father in heaven is what it's about. 
Okay, so that first little section is followed in verse 17 by, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So it's interesting here because uh, he hasn't talked much about the law or the prophets yet. And yet, he's, you know, because in this section about salt and light, he's talking about, you know, you'll be thrown out and trampled by men. He's giving a law ex uh, explanation about those who are not good at living out their discipleship and doing good deeds, right? So in a way, he is talking about the same kind of laws that Moses talked about. And yet, some people may have thought, well, who, who, who is this guy? He's talking about stuff that he doesn't have the authority to talk about, as, as if Jesus didn't know, you know, like maybe he was coming up with something new, right? He, he's not talking about anything new. In fact, this is his whole point here. Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets is a way of talking about two-thirds of the Old Testament. The law is the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, and the prophets includes the the history books, which are called the former prophets by the Jewish people, which includes Joshua through Second Kings, and then the prophets include the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the twelve minor prophets. Right. So notice that for the Jewish people that they have this um, symmetry. So when Jesus talks about the law and the prophets, you got the five books of the law, and then the prophets are made up of four former prophets, which are the four books that are included as the history books, but they combine first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. Right? So you've got Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Four four different scrolls. And then you've got the four latter prophets, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then all twelve of the minor prophets fits on a single scroll. So that's considered the scroll of the twelve. So that's how, how they would have looked at it. So he's, t he's talking about the majority of the Old Testament. He, it's interesting he doesn't mention the writings, which was the third section of the Old Testament. But he does in another place. In other places in the, Old in the New Testament, Jesus, when he talks about the third part of the, uh, of the Old Testament, he calls it the Psalms. So the Psalms is the largest part of the writings, which includes like, you know, the wisdom, wisdom books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It also includes things like Daniel, which was Apocrypha, like talking about the end days and stuff. So the law, the prophets, and the writings are the three parts of the Old Testament. But um, I don't think that I, – I think that one of the reasons why maybe he, at this point he doesn't mention the writings is because maybe in the audience there were some Sadducees because the Sadducees are, are the ones who only acknowledge that the law was part of the Bible. And then – and then maybe uh, the, some of the Pharisees didn't always agree that everything that was part of the writings would necessarily be talking about the coming of a Messiah, but they definitely believed that the prophets did. So he just includes these two sections in order for those people who maybe were skeptical of who he was to show, well, look, everything I'm saying actually shows that I'm fulfilling these major portions of the Old Testament. And he says, I, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so how does, how does he do that? He doesn't explain how he can do that. But uh, he goes on in verse 18 to say, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So, you know, he's not... Um, Jesus is uh, is describing how in the... In the Hebrew writing, um, you know, he, I think that some translations say that not the least dot or tittle will disappear, right? So here it says the smallest letter and the least stroke of a pen. Those are actually English equivalents of the dot and the tittle. The dot is a vowel. Like in Hebrew, they'll have the consonants on the line, and then underneath it, he'll, they'll put dots that are the the, the vowels. So the consonants, the Hebrew was originally written just in consonants, right? So God's name is Yahweh, and Yahweh in Hebrew is just four letters. Y, W, H, W. Yahweh. I'm sorry, uh, y, I'm sorry, Y, H, W, H. That's the four letters that makes up God's name. Then underneath it, it has vowels, and the vowels are, um, were added later 
in order to help people who didn't necessarily know how to pronounce the Hebrew to be able to say it, right? And so when it tells us that Jesus is not going to, he did, he, that uh, um, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. So like the smallest letter was the letter Yod, which is like a little, it looks like a, almost like an apostrophe. It's real tiny. You know, other letters in Hebrew are like, it looked like a little chair. So the least letter, the Yod, and the least dot, which is literally just a dot, which is the letter O in Hebrew, if you put a dot there. And so those are small letters. And if you take the dot out of a word, it changes the meaning. So it's kind of like in English, if you have like run and ran, the vowel is, it's uh, if it's a U, it means past tense. If it's an A, the vowel is A in the word ran, then it is present tense. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, run as present tense and ran as past tense, right? So, so, so you have the changing of the vowel changes the word. It changes the tense. And so in Hebrew, if you have a dot, that's the letter O. If you take that off, then all of a sudden it could be, some, it could be something else. It changes the meaning of the word. So Jesus is not changing God's word. He is God's word. He is the fulfillment of the word. Everything he says is going to be true, and he's not trying to, to uh, make a new thing. See, the Pharisees believed that Jesus was changing God's word. Oh, who do you think you are coming and telling us that you can uh, eat whatever food you want and you don't have to observe the Sabbath? Well, he wasn't breaking the law of God. He was breaking the laws of the Pharisees and their interpretation of the law. Because nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, that you, sh you shall not help people on the Sabbath day. It says rest on the Sabbath day, but it also, if you read through the text, you'll find passages like, oh, if a person's, a neighbor's uh, horse or, or donkey falls into a, 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 a ditch on the Sabbath day, or your child falls into a well on the Sabbath day, do you just let them die because it's the Sabbath and you're not allowed to work? No, you help people because helping people on the Sabbath day is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. So Jesus purposely healed people on the Sabbath because helping people on the Sabbath is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. But the Pharisees said he was breaking it because they came up with their own definitions of work and they said, oh, you're practicing medicine on the Sabbath. You're pr pretending to be a doctor. You're obviously doing work and that's a sin because it, God said don't work. And so they, it's like they were looking at the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. See, God did not give us the laws because he needed humans to keep the law in order to make the law something great. Instead, he gave the law for the benefit of humans so that our lives would be better. And, uh, and so he had the right understanding of the law that God gave it as a gift and that it is to help people because the fulfillment of the law and the prophets is love, right? If you love, you fulfill the law. The Pharisees didn't have any love in their hearts. They didn't care about people. They cared more about themselves. They always looked down on other people. So Jesus is saying that nothing, n nothing in the law and the prophets will disappear until it's fulfilled. So he, his life is showing the fulfillment of a lot of these things. And, but ultimately, the final things that will be fulfilled in the Bible won't happen until Jesus is returned. So... Uh, everything that Jesus is doing is showing that he's going to bring about the fulfillment of um, of his uh, of the Old Testament in his ministry. And he's, he's talking about, you know, until heaven and earth disappear, and that doesn't happen until the last day. And so Jesus is going to return and recreate the heavens and the earth. So again, it's like looking far into the future. In verse 19, he says, Jesus says, Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So the Pharisees hearing this in the crowd may have thought, well, that's us. We teach everybody to keep the commandments. But in fact, Jesus came up with examples that showed that the Pharisees actually used com some commandments in order to break other commandments. Right, they, they were like lawyers looking for the loophole, right? For instance, there was an example where a Pharisee could say, I'm going to dedicate my entire estate, like my house and my money and everything, to the Lord. And so there's a phrase in, there, in the Hebrew, korban, 
which means uh, a, a, a dedicated gift to the Lord. So they could say, uh, oh, my, my aging parents, they need uh, money to be cared for, but I, I can't give it to them because I have dedicated my money to the Lord, and that's not my money anymore. It's God's money, and it's already been, I've already made an oath, so the money can't be used for my parents anymore. So in essence, the Pharisees found a way to never have to help people like their parents and they were and they because they were supposedly were keeping the oath because the Old Testament says if you break an oath then that would be condemned by God so they basically made an oath so they didn't have to use their money but then by doing so they were breaking the fourth commandment honor your father and mother uh, and so Jesus was like you know, pointing out their hypocrisy and he's saying you know that that's not what I'm doing that I'm I'm here to show the spirit of the law the truth of the law is that it points out that points out that we're sinners it's it also shows us what God's will is humans couldn't do this but Jesus perfectly kept it and he is not only our example but he's the only one who could actually do it on our behalf so Jesus kept the law in our place he took our place and he he lived the perfect life and he died the perfect death so that we could have the, a perfect life by faith in him so Jesus um, he credits our lives with the benefits that he has earned through his perfect life. Uh, so anyways, he, he, he gives us kind of a, another condemnation, similar to the, at the end of the salt thing about being thrown out. In verse 19 he says, Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be the least in the kingdom. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't say anybody who teaches somebody not to do these, he doesn't say they're going to go to hell. He's just talking about, as a believer in Jesus, be careful of what your witness is. If you give a bad witness, then that's going to bring you down in God's kingdom. It's that, you know, the good thing is it's not saying that you're going to go to hell because you didn't obey all the commandments. But think about what a warning that is. Here we have, in our world today, we have like hundreds of Christian denominations. And some Christian denominations focus on one thing, some focus on another. Are they all the same? No. Some will be higher in the kingdom of heaven. Some will be lower in the kingdom of heaven. Hopefully, you won't be excluded from heaven by your beliefs. So I think that if you believe that you ha you can only ba baptize babies, and some people say you can only baptize adults, God's going to judge about which one of those is right, but it won't get you kicked out of heaven. But if you say, I believe that Jesus is only a human being, that's going to get you kicked out of heaven because that's not having true faith in Jesus as the Son of God, as it says in the Bible. So some things are salvation issues, other than things that are not. And so Jesus is obviously talking about the things that are not salvation issues. So if you teach people to, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody would purposely teach somebody to break the commandment, but maybe people come up with, in their own minds, their own justification for breaking a commandment. For instance, you might say, um, I don't know. I mean, there's no commandment against drinking, but Jesus talks about not getting drunk. And so some people might say, uh, you know, uh, there are people who say that drinking is completely wrong. And so maybe teaching some people that drinking is completely wrong might make somebody despair because they might drink and then they'll feel guilty and they'll feel like maybe they can't be a good Christian. Maybe they can't even be a Christian. Maybe they're not even saved. So that could lead somebody to despair. It could go the other way as well. And a person could say, well, because the Bible doesn't say it's wrong to drink, that you can drink all you want. And then they become an alcoholic or they lead other people to live a life that hurts them. And so that can be a dangerous thing. And so your freedom of your faith can lead another person to our, their downfall. And so Jesus is warning us about how we should not um, hurt other people in the way that we live our lives. Right? Okay. If you eat regular, it's all right. But if you always do it, it's not good. <laughs> right. Well, and Paul talks about eating uh, unkosher food. That's in f right. No, no, mo meat offered to idols. Right? He says if you eat meat offered to idols, it's not a big deal. But if the person says, oh, I'm giving you meat offered to idols that you shouldn't do it, but then if, if you're doing it in front of another person who might affect their faith, you've got to be careful. It's all about your concern for the other person's faith. You don't want to be so selfish and say, I only care about myself. 
So yeah, there's all kinds of, Jesus talks about lots of different things and Paul does as well. Um, and it's interesting, he doesn't really say that this is going to send you to hell, but he does talk about, you know, it's in, he talks about levels of heaven. There are some people will be greater in, in heaven and some people will be lower in heaven because of, you know, where are they were they good witnesses or not? Um, so I don't think, you know, that we need to like be in competition who's going to be greatest in heaven. Because when Jesus talked to his disciples about who's greatest in heaven, he said, the greatest in heaven is the one who's the servant of all. So whoever's last will be first, whoever's first will be last. So, you know, th there's a, uh, an upside downness about what it means to be great in heaven that Jesus talks about at a later time. But here he's specifically talking about um, about uh, misleading people and that if you teach people that they shouldn't concern themselves with the laws and you know in our age today that's especially a problem there's lots of people who look at the Bible and say oh you don't need to do that you know and and so different denominations are allowing all kinds of uh, uh, terrible things you know I, I I've actually heard of some very liberal pastors preaching against uh, the idea that premarital sex is wrong. And I'm all thinking, how could you say that? God does not want people to be promiscuous. He wants people to be faithful in their marriages. And so pr pr preaching about that that's okay to, to sleep with whoever you want, I mean, that, that sounds like a heretical thing to me. And so those people are obviously teaching people to disobey some of the commandments, and that could be a dangerous thing. Whether they get in heaven or not, that's up to God. But that's a dangerous precedent. And in verse 20, he concludes this section. He says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you know, we know that the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law, that they actually were, you know, they didn't have faith in Jesus. So it almost sounds like if they're really bad then, and you have to be better than them, that's not too hard. But that's in the context of the people listening to this, they all thought, well, everybody knows that the Pharisees are really holy. And so Jesus is saying, you have to be you know, even holier. The, the, the question that would come to the mind of a person who, who would originally hear this is, if even the Pharisees aren't good enough, how can I ever get to heaven? And Jesus' answer would be, uh, nobody can get, for man this is impossible, but for God, it, everything is impossible. Is possible. So Jesus wants us to, to to despair in ourselves, so that we have to lay ourselves at the feet of Jesus and completely trust in Him, because you're not going to get to heaven by your good works. You're going to get to heaven by your uh, by your faith. So when it talked about back in um, verse uh, sixteen, when it says that the, that uh, do your good works before men that they may see these good works and praise your Father in heaven, He's not saying that. You'll, you're going to be saved by your good works. He's saying that your good works are the result of your faith. That the Pharisees have it all wrong. They think that they're going to be saved by their good works. But you have to be even greater than that because you, you can't get into heaven by being a, acting like a good person. You actually have to have faith in Jesus who covers your sins. So, again, he's talking about not trusting in your own good deeds but trusting in God and doing real deeds, good deeds, out of love. The Pharisees didn't have a whole lot of love, and so to be greater, have greater righteousness than them means to you can't just act like you're good. You actually have to have a good heart, and so that and that's the result of faith. Um, okay, well that um, that's the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we'll stop there, and next week we'll continue with verse twenty-one.